Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of a woman named Leslie Herring. Leslie lived in California in the US and her sudden disappearance in early 2009 just completely shocked and confused everyone that knew her, her loved ones, as it was completely out of her character. And when police were informed and they became involved with the case, they quickly realised that this probably wasn't just a missing persons inquiry, this was a homicide investigation, despite the fact that they could not find Leslie's body. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to one of my favourites, HelloFresh, for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. I'm sure most of you will have heard me talk about HelloFresh before. They are a meal kit delivery service and they offer so many different delicious recipes every single week which can be delivered straight to your door. The thing that I love about HelloFresh is that they save you so much time. Obviously we're coming up to December, the holidays are fast approaching now and for me this time of year is the best but always the busiest. I always feel like I'm just rushing around trying to get so much done before Christmas. However, HelloFresh helps to make this time of year easier than ever by making cooking simple and quick. All you have to do is go to the HelloFresh website, pick which meals you would like that week and then they will send you the instructions on how to make the meal and all of the pre-portioned ingredients that you will need. So it means that you don't have to make a trip to the supermarket, you don't have to spend loads of time figuring out what ingredients you need and how much of each ingredient a recipe requires. Every single thing that you will need will be in your HelloFresh box. So you can spend less time in the kitchen and more time having fun with family and friends this festive season. They offer quick and easy meal kits, meals that you can whip up in literally like 20 minutes, it's insane. You can customise your recipes by swapping proteins and sides. There is something for everyone to enjoy on HelloFresh. Fresh. and their plans are completely flexible too so say for example you usually have four HelloFresh recipes delivered every week but for some reason one week you don't need all four maybe you're eating out a bit more that week or something well with HelloFresh you can change how many recipes you want each week so that no food goes to waste so if you would like to check out HelloFresh for yourself then go to hellofresh.com and use the code 70 molly to get an incredible 70% off plus free shipping. The link to HelloFresh will also be at the top line of the description box. A huge thank you once again to HelloFresh for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys as always for supporting the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. Just before we continue please listen carefully to the following. This video contains heavy themes such as violence towards women, domestic abuse and the theme of suicide is also briefly mentioned. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case we are going back to the year 2009 in LA, Los Angeles, which is obviously located in Southern California in the US. And this is Leslie Ann Herring. She was 44 years old at the time that this case occurred. She was born on the 21st of March 1964 and she was originally from the country of Guyana. That's where she and her family lived when Leslie was very young. Leslie's mother was named Vivian and I couldn't find the name of her father anymore. Anywhere. I'm unsure whether he was really in the picture or not. But I do know that Leslie was one of three children. She had two siblings, a brother named Lyndon and a sister named Asha. And Leslie was always incredibly close with her family. I believe she was the oldest one out of her siblings and she was so, so close to them and also very protective. She was roughly nine years older than her little sister Asha and Asha said that in a way Leslie was like a second mum to her. Because because their mother Vivian was always very very busy with work. She was a single mother so she was working hard to bring money in and pay the bills so naturally that meant that she wasn't at home with her kids as much as I'm sure she would have liked to have been. And so Leslie being the oldest stepped up. Like I said she became like a second mum. She was so caring and she always tried to look after her siblings and she just loved spending time with her siblings especially her sister Asha. In fact something that really really 
really made me giggle whilst I was researching this case was that Asha said that even when Leslie was older and she started seeing boys and going on dates, she would even take her little sister with her on these dates. Asha would just tag along and Leslie didn't mind at all. In fact, she loved it. That's how inseparable they were. Leslie was like a natural born leader. I don't think she was necessarily bossy, but she liked being in charge, which didn't really bother anyone in her family, to be honest, from what I can gather. They liked it when Leslie took charge of things and situations because, you know, she was very organised and focused, very reliable. She was very much a no-nonsense kind of person. Leslie and her family moved to the US when she was still just a young child. They started building a life for themselves there. And then when Leslie was around 33 years old in 1997, she and her sister Asha, who would have been around 24 years old, moved to LA, moved to the Hollywood area. As I understand it, Asha moved there a few months before Leslie made the move and I think the main reason that Asha relocated there was for her career. You see, Asha was an actress so I imagine she wanted to move to Hollywood to hopefully get more opportunities in the acting field. And you know what? She did incredibly well for herself. Asha Davis actually became a pretty well-known actress. She secured roles in many films and TV shows. I didn't know her name when I first started researching this case but I knew that I recognised recognised her and that's because she's actually been in one of my favourite TV shows, Grey's Anatomy. She was a guest star in a season 3 episode of Grey's. She played a woman called Rena. but as I said she's been in many other TV shows too. She's been in Criminal Minds, Friday Night Lights, Gilmore Girls. She's been a series regular in shows like The Unwritten Rules and Drunk History as well as being in a few films too. So yeah she's done really well for herself, a very very talented woman and of course her big sister Leslie was so proud of her. As for Leslie, when she moved to the Hollywood area, she found work at a home security firm. She had a desk job there, which by all accounts she enjoyed and yeah, she was happy. She was building a new life for herself in Hollywood. And life for Leslie only got even better when, I believe not long after she moved to Hollywood, she met and fell in love with a man named Lyle Herring. They met at the 99 cent store, actually. He worked as a college recruiter and he was quite a bit older than Leslie, about 11 or 12 years older, I think. But despite the age gap, they got on so well. As I said, they fell in love and soon got married. They got married within just a year of meeting. So now Leslie was Leslie Herring. And everyone that knew the couple said that from that point on, they were inseparable. And they were so similar, so similar in their likes and their dislikes, even in their style. Apparently they would dress quite similar and wear the same things a lot. And Leslie's family considered Lyle a member of their family. They really, really liked Lyle. In fact, Lyle was way closer to his wife's family than he was his own. But early 2009, Lyle and Leslie Herring had been together and married for 11 years and they lived together in a really, really nice condo within an apartment building near Hollywood. Leslie had just become an aunt, which she was very excited about. Her little sister, Asha, had just given birth to a baby boy, so Lyle and Leslie now had a nephew. And the couple appeared to have a good life. They seemed happy, so understandably, everyone in their life, their family and friends, were incredibly shocked and confused when both Lyle and Leslie just suddenly went missing in February of 2009. It was the 10th of February 2009 when Leslie's sister Asha received a phone call from Leslie's work. Her boss at the security firm contacted Asha and basically said, I just wanted to double check that Leslie is okay because she was due to be in work yesterday and today and she just hasn't turned up and she didn't get in touch to let me know that she wasn't going to come into work either. And literally as soon as Asha heard this, she gasped. Immediately she knew that something wasn't right here because this was so not like her sister. Like I mentioned, Leslie was an incredibly organised and reliable person. It was not in her character to just not show up for work. Leslie had worked that job for more than a decade and I actually read that in her many, many, many years there, she had never missed a single day. She had always been there for every single shift. So Asha just knew that something must have happened. 
so as soon as she got off the phone she started ringing around the rest of the family she rang her brother and told him that Leslie hadn't turned up for work and he agreed that that was very odd she rang their mum Vivian and told her she also thought that it was incredibly strange although I think by this point Vivian herself had a feeling that something wasn't right anyway because she and Leslie always spoke on the phone every single day without fail sometimes even twice a day Leslie would ring her mum once in the morning and most afternoons too and she hadn't done that for a few days which again was very out of character I believe the last time anyone in the family heard from Leslie was the 7th of February which was a Saturday and then after that nothing radio silence and so immediately after this realization the family started trying to get in touch with Leslie's husband Lyle because they live together if anyone's going to know where she is it's probably going to be him however they could just not get through to Lyle they were trying to ring his phone constantly and he wasn't picking up and obviously it was the same with Leslie's phone she wasn't answering calls or text messages either so I believe it was then when Leslie's family started thinking well has something happened to both of them are both Lyle and Leslie missing so to try and find out exactly what was going on here Leslie's sister Asha and also her husband went to Leslie and Lyle's home their condo and when they arrived they noticed that Leslie's car was parked outside but Lyle's wasn't I don't believe his was gone and so they headed to the condo Asha knocked on the door but no one answered it so it seemed as though there was no one inside so they went back to the parking lot and they decided to wait maybe they thought that if they waited long enough Lyle and Leslie were bound to show up they're bound to return at some point and it was whilst they were waiting when they spoke to one of Lyle and Leslie's neighbours who pulled into the parking garage and they asked this neighbour if they had seen or spoken to Lyle or Leslie in the last few days and interestingly this neighbour said oh I think I saw Lyle yesterday but no I haven't seen Leslie recently so anyway Asha and her husband continued waiting and waiting and waiting but they had no luck at one point they did think that they saw a car that looked like Lyle's driving past the entrance to the parking garage so they thought that it may have been him however it drove away so they assumed that it wasn't him neither of them came back and they still weren't responding to any calls or text messages and so ultimately Leslie's family decided that it was time to go to the police and ask for help because they were so so worried about both of them the family were naturally just thinking the worst you know they were thinking had they gotten into an accident had they been abducted and attacked had something happened to them whilst they were out at sea because Lyle and Leslie had their own um, sailboat which they enjoyed going out on so the family were thinking had they had an accident on the boat and drowned or something so yeah they went to the police station and they reported them as missing although it didn't really appear as though the police took the case that seriously initially Asha said that they took Leslie and Lyle's missing persons report and they just kind of put it on the top of a huge pile of other missing persons reports that the LAPD were currently Currently investigating they clearly had so many others to go through perhaps because Leslie and Lyle were both missing the police didn't really think that it was a priority case maybe they thought that perhaps this married couple had just decided to go away for a while together for a short break or something who knows however shortly after Leslie's sister Asha left the police station she received a call from one of Lyle's cousins his name was Malcolm and Malcolm said to Asha something along the lines of look I've been spending some time with Lyle over the last couple of days so after Leslie disappeared and he's just been acting so strange and saying really odd things Malcolm even said that Lyle kind of seemed like he was suicidal he was really upset and distraught about something and apparently every time Malcolm mentioned Leslie Lyle would snap at him and say don't say her name I don't ever want to hear her name again I don't want to talk about her anymore Malcolm also later told the police I believe that at one point he was talking to Lyle outside of his condo and Lyle was again saying really weird things like I'm gonna burn in hell for what I did to Leslie so Malcolm asked if he could use the bathroom in Lyle's condo he didn't really want to use the bathroom he just wanted to go inside the home to see if Leslie was there and if she was okay but Lyle said no he wouldn't let his cousin go inside almost like there was something 
in there that he wanted to hide. Malcolm thought that maybe Lyle and Leslie had had a fight or something and that they'd split up, which is why Lyle was such a mess. And another thing that Malcolm said, another thing that he told Asha on the phone, was that he was recently in the car with Lyle. They were driving to Lyle and Leslie's condo and Lyle was about to pull into his apartment building parking garage when all of a sudden he stopped and made a sudden turn left and started driving away and Malcolm said to him what's going on why are we driving away from your condo and apparently Lyle said something like I just saw some people in the driveway that I don't want to see I don't want to speak to right now and as soon as Asha heard this she realized that Lyle was talking about her and her husband remember after knocking on Lyle and Leslie's front door and not getting any response Asha and her partner had been waiting in the parking garage for one of them or both of them to turn up and if you're cool I said that at one point they saw a car matching the description of Lyle's car driving past the entrance and they thought it was him but then the car drove away but after hearing this from Malcolm she realized that it was Lyle it was his car and as soon as he saw Asha he carried on driving he was avoiding her he was avoiding Leslie's sister but why as I said initially when neither Leslie nor Lyle were answering their phones the family were thinking, has something happened to both of them? Are both of them missing? But now that Asha had heard this from Malcolm, it seemed as though it was just Leslie that was missing and that Lyle perhaps had a guilty conscience about something because why else would he hide and avoid her? So it was after speaking to Malcolm when Asha went straight back to the police station. She told them about this call that she had had from Lyle's cousin Malcolm and about Lyle's really bizarre behaviour and as soon as the police heard this they immediately jumped into action. I think they realised that Leslie Herring probably wasn't just another missing person that would eventually turn up. Maybe something far more sinister had happened to her and maybe her own husband was involved. So following this, LAPD detectives became involved with the case and the search for Leslie Herring and also Lyle Herring began because I don't think even Malcolm knew where Lyle was at this point. They had several lines of inquiry to look into. So for example, the police were checking in with local hospitals to find out if even of them had been admitted maybe they really had had an accident and they needed medical attention but there was no luck there they even checked with the local coroner's office but again nothing they notified other police teams in southern california to keep an eye out for this missing married couple and of course they also sent some officers down to the couple's home their condo just to double check that they weren't inside and sure enough they weren't when the police got inside the home neither lyle nor Leslie were there and to be honest nothing about the apartment really seemed off like there was nothing that really stood out as being strange there didn't seem to be any signs of a struggle there was no blood or anything the home looked pretty clean although they did notice that on the kitchen side near the sink there was a candle and next to it some spilt candle wax and this caught the police's attention because they had already been informed by Leslie's family what kind of person she was and one of the things that they all said was that Leslie was a very tidy woman she liked her home to be neat and tidy at all times she was the kind of person that if she or Lyle had made a mess she would clean it up straight away she wouldn't just leave it so the fact that there was some spilt candle wax on the kitchen side seemed quite odd why hadn't she cleaned that up in addition to that after looking in the bathrooms I think there were two bathrooms in the condo well in both bathrooms they noticed a load of towels hung up they were draped over the showers as if someone had put them there to dry I believe some of the towels had a bit of mold on them and there were so so many hung up to dry that it seemed as though maybe someone had used them to clean up a load of water maybe there was a bit of a flood in the bathroom or something the bath had spilled over and someone had used these towels to soak up all the water detectives also noticed that Leslie's jewelry was on her her nightstand next to her bed it had just been left on her nightstand which was another thing that seemed a bit strange because her family had also informed the police that Leslie wore her jewelry every single day without fail she would take it off before bed and then she would put it straight back on in the morning when she woke up so this confused the police why wasn't Leslie 
wearing her jewellery wherever she was? Why did she just leave it behind? Another thing that she seemed to have left behind was her bag, her purse. It had just been left, I think, in her closet, which, again, was odd. But apart from those few things, the police didn't really find anything else in the home, nothing particularly alarming, and so the search for the couple just continued. However, days went by and there was nothing, absolutely no sign of either of them. They didn't return to their condo, they still weren't answering any calls or messages. It was literally like both Lyle and Leslie Herring had just vanished into thin air until about two weeks later, about a fortnight after their disappearance, there was a huge development in the case when detectives received a lead regarding Lyle Herring's car. Obviously, the police had put out basically an APB on his car so that if the license plate was spotted, the car would be stopped. And two weeks into the search, his car was stopped, actually at the Mexican border. The person driving his car had been trying to cross it to come back into the US. So as soon as the detectives received this news, they headed to the border to see who was driving Lyle's car. And as you might expect, it was Lyle. However, his wife Leslie was not with him. Lyle had been found, but Leslie was still missing. So the police took Lyle to a police station. They sat down with him and they started asking him questions. Obviously, they needed to know what had gone on. Where had he been for two weeks? And where was Leslie? And Lyle actually said that he too hadn't seen Leslie in weeks. He said that the last time that he saw her, they actually had an argument. They'd been arguing about something one evening until eventually they both went to bed. However, he said that the next morning, which I believe was Sunday the 8th of February, so a few days before she was reported as missing, he said that the morning after their argument, he woke up and his wife was gone. She wasn't in the apartment and she never returned home. He didn't know what had happened to her. He even said that he himself had been spending the last few weeks looking for his wife. Apparently, he told the detectives that before their argument, he and Leslie had planned a little trip away, a holiday to Mexico for Valentine's. So he said that that was the reason why he was in Mexico. He thought that she may have gone there, despite the fact that they were fighting at the time. Maybe she still decided to go on the trip. So Lyle went to Mexico to see if he could find her, but he couldn't. And he also said that he had been trying to ring her phone constantly, and just like everyone else, he was getting no response. A little off topic here for a second, but another thing that the police asked Lyle about was actually his hair. They asked him what happened to his hair. You see, Lyle usually had dreadlocks, these long, thick dreadlocks, but now they were suddenly gone. He was bald. And he actually said that a gang had cut them off. He told the police that he had been jumped by this shady gang that he owed money to for something. And because he didn't have the money to pay them back, they carried out revenge on him by cutting off all of his hair. Although, to be completely honest, I don't think the police really believed him. I mean, of all things, why would a gang take revenge on someone by cutting their hair. I've certainly never heard of anything like that. You know, you hear of gangs beating people up as revenge, but I've never heard of a gang cutting off someone's hair as payback. So yeah, that seemed really bizarre. It does kind of seem as though he was trying to trying to hint to the detectives that maybe the shady gang could have been responsible for his wife's disappearance. Maybe, as another act of revenge against Lyle, they abducted his wife. But again, I don't think the police were buying it. It almost seemed as though he was trying to develop a cover story or something. They carried on asking Lyle questions about Leslie anyway. They asked him if it was like her to do something like this after an argument. Had she ever taken off before and not kept in touch? And it was then when Lyle basically refused to answer any more questions. He spoke to them for about half an hour or so and then out of the blue he said that he had nothing more to say. He did not want to speak to the police anymore and so 
they let him go. They kind of had to. They were very, very suspicious of him, don't get me wrong. And they were sure that he knew way more than he was letting on. But equally, they didn't have any evidence against him, really. Not enough evidence to charge him with anything anyway. So Lyle was released and the investigation into the disappearance of Leslie Herring continued. But you know what? It wasn't long before they uncovered a huge, huge clue in the case. They found something which ultimately pointed to a motive that Lyle might have had for wanting his wife to disappear, maybe even wanting her dead. From what I can gather, as all of this was going on, the police were still conducting searches of Lyle and Leslie's condo. When he returned from Mexico, Lyle had to stay elsewhere whilst the investigation continued. And something that they found in the home was a letter written by Leslie, and it was addressed to Lyle. She'd written her husband a letter. And in this letter, Leslie basically said that she didn't want to be with Lyle any more and that she was going to leave him. Apparently they had been having a lot of money problems, financial problems, because Lyle wasn't working. I'm not quite sure what happened with his job as a college recruiter, but yeah, he wasn't working at the time, so they were just living on Leslie's income. And it didn't really seem as though he was bothering to find another job either. And it also didn't seem as though he was being honest with his wife about why he wasn't working. And this was so stressful for Leslie. She was worrying so, so much about money and he wasn't doing anything to help. She wrote in the letter, quote, I know you are the type that wouldn't tell me if you were fired or quit. You would wait until the collectors are knocking on the door. Do you have any idea how stressful it is to spend money on a vacation? Thinking that your husband doesn't have a job? Thinking you should cancel the vacation and save the money for what is to come? No one should have to live this way. Live day to day not knowing if they will have a roof or the other necessities of life. I deserve better. I deserve more. What's the point of talking to you so you can lie, lie, lie? I have survived many horrible situations that you have put me through but each time the experience has left me more damage. I don't think that I can recover from this last experience. I can't take any more. I am broken. So it's clear from that letter that Leslie had gotten to a point where she was very, very unhappy in her marriage. She did not want to be with this man anymore. And I think, to be honest, this was a real surprise to the majority of people in Leslie's life. When the police spoke to friends and family, they all said that they thought that Lyle and Leslie were happy happy and still very much in love. They had no idea that anything was wrong. Although it was a different story when police spoke to Leslie's mother, Vivian. It appears as though Vivian was really the only person that Leslie did confide in about her marriage troubles. Vivian said that Leslie and Lyle had been fighting for a while before this case took place, for at least a few months. And apparently things were very tense between the couple that weekend in February anyway because of a meal that Lyle had cooked Leslie. He reportedly put a spice in this meal that Leslie didn't like to have in her food because it often triggered a migraine for her. So they argued about that. But as I said, the majority of their arguments leading up to this case taking place were about their financial issues. Apparently, Lyle had even been stealing money from his wife. He'd been taking money out of her bank account without asking. He'd even forged her signature and committed identity theft so that he could get access to her bank account. And she found out about this and she was so angry at her husband, obviously. And she mentioned to her mother a few times that she had had enough and that she was planning on leaving Lyle at some point. And Vivian even said to her daughter, well, when you do leave him, don't tell him what you're doing. Just pack a bag and leave. But of course, that letter that the police found shows that Leslie didn't really do what her mother said. She did let Lyle know that she was going to leave him in this letter. So the police had a theory that maybe Lyle read the letter. He was furious at his wife and he decided to do something to her, maybe even kill her because perhaps in his eyes, if he couldn't have her, then no one could. And as the police were uncovering more evidence and there was still no sign of Leslie, I think they knew that foul play probably had been involved in this case, that Leslie had probably been murdered and the top suspect 
was of course her husband Lyle and as the investigation continued they just found even more evidence which seemed to support their theory, even more evidence against Lyle Herring. For example they found evidence in Leslie's purse. If you remember earlier I said that when the police first went to Leslie and Lyle's home they noticed that her purse had just been left in her closet and when the police looked inside her purse they found a receipt. It was a receipt from a local Starbucks coffee shop and interestingly the date on this receipt was the 9th of February 2009 which was the first day that Leslie didn't turn up for work. Remember her boss rang Leslie's sister Asha the day after this on the 10th and said that Leslie hadn't been at work for two days but this receipt seemed to indicate that despite not having gone to work on the 9th she had gone to a coffee shop. To be honest when the police first found this receipt I think initially they were quite hopeful that maybe Leslie was okay after all since this receipt seemed to be from after she went missing. So the police eventually went to this Starbucks and they had to look through the shop's CCTV footage expecting to spot Leslie on it. However they didn't. She wasn't spotted on it once but do you know who they did spot on it? Leslie's husband Lyle. He was the one who had been to the Starbucks on the 9th of February. He walked in on his own, he ordered one coffee, he took the receipt and then for some reason he put this receipt in his wife's purse where it was later found by the police and it was after the police saw this CCTV footage when they thought what if Lyle wanted us to find the Starbucks receipt. If he had done something to Leslie, if he had killed her, what if this was all a part of his cover-up? He clearly wanted the police to think that she was still alive and to try and prove this he tried to make it look like she had been to Starbucks after she supposedly went missing. He had planted this evidence in her purse although he clearly forgot about the CCTV cameras. He didn't realise that the police would check the Starbucks CCTV and it wasn't just the Starbucks receipt that suggested that there was a cover-up going on here. When the police checked Lyle's cell phone records, they discovered that in the days after Leslie's disappearance, he had been ringing his wife's phone numerous times and she never answered. When he was interviewed after he was found at the Mexican border, he even said that. He said to the police that he had been trying to call her but she wasn't answering and that they could check his phone records if they wanted to to prove this. And like I said, his cell phone records did in fact prove this. He had been trying to call her. But another thing that he did didn't quite realise was that the police were also going to check the Sow Tower usage to determine where both Lyle's phone and Leslie's phone were during the times that he was making these calls and through doing this the police actually discovered that both phones were in the exact same location they were right next to each other which indicated that Lyle had his wife's phone and that when he was ringing it it was right next to him. So again this was planted evidence. He was trying to make it look like he was this concerned husband who was desperately trying to get a hold of his wife when in actual fact he was he was covering something up here. The police also had to look through Lyle's computer search history and they discovered that he had used the internet to search up things like violent deaths, profile of a mass murderer, the top 10 common methods of suicide, as well as searches like what country can I flee to? So the police had uncovered quite a substantial amount of evidence that implicated Lyle at this point. Although having said that, it was mainly circumstantial. They didn't necessarily have that concrete proof just yet. They were more confident than ever that Lyle did something to his wife but from what I can gather due to the lack of evidence they couldn't arrest and charge him just yet. I mean they still had no idea where Leslie was. If she was dead they still hadn't found her body. So whilst detectives carried on looking for evidence against Lyle the searches were still going on for Leslie. Leslie's sister Asha I believe did several TV interviews to try and 
and spread the word about her sister's disappearance. The family and the police held a press conference in which they appealed to the public for information. This took place just under two months after Leslie vanished and even Lyle Herring himself attended this press conference and he spoke during it just like the rest of the family. He pleaded to the public for information regarding his wife. He pleaded to Leslie. He spoke directly to her and said that if she was watching the conference or listening to it to please get in touch. Uh, if Leslie's out there listening to us, please give us a call, come home, let us know what's going on. He was saying all these things, I think completely unaware of the evidence that the police had found that suggested that he was involved. But then, bizarrely, after Lyle spoke, the lead detective in the case began answering questions from reporters. And one of the questions that he was asked was, is Lyle Herring being helpful and cooperative in the search for his wife? And the detective basically said, no, no, he's not. And Lyle was standing right there. Has he been cooperative? I would describe his cooperation as fragmented and less than helpful. And following this, he went on to kind of list the ways that Lyle had been uncooperative and how his stories were not consistent. And in fairness, that was true. Lyle wasn't being cooperative. I mean, within the first like half an hour of his interview, he refused to talk to the police anymore. As I understand it, the police weren't even accusing him of anything at that point, And he still refused to answer questions, even though his partner, the love of his life was missing. She was possibly in danger. And it seemed like he didn't want to help. This is your opportunity to speak. This is your Let me clarify one thing. So we will be taking things out of context, okay? I had an opportunity to uh, take a trip. Uh, we've had an opportunity to take a trip to uh, uh, Mexico, Rosarita, to celebrate for Valentine's Day. I went down there to look for her. So yeah, he was being unhelpful in fairness, but I don't really know how to feel about the detective making that public at the press conference. It just seems quite risky, I think, because, you know, as I said, Lyle was right there when he said it. And by publicly saying that he was being inconsistent and uncooperative and this and that, the detectives risk Lyle doing something like taking off, trying to flee and go on the run, and then they might never find Leslie. But then on the other hand, maybe they thought that this pressure would push him into making a confession if he realized that the police were onto him maybe he would maybe he would give it up and he would just confess but i believe that the detectives also hoped that if they made it obvious to the public in this press conference that they were suspicious of lyle that they were looking into him as a person of interest maybe someone out there would come forward with information about lyle herring maybe someone would remember having heard lyle say something or do something that at the time they didn't think was that strange but then on reflection after realizing that the police were looking into him they might have thought that it could have been connected to Leslie's case if that makes sense. I think that was what the police were really hoping they would get out of doing this press conference some more information or evidence from a member of the public that implicated Lyle Herring and as it turns out that is exactly what happened. Not long after the press conference, the police were contacted by a man who lived in the same apartment building as Lyle and Leslie Herring. He was one of their neighbours. This neighbour's name was Daniel and he said that late one evening, around the time that Leslie disappeared, I believe specifically it was late in the evening on the 7th of February slash early hours of the morning on the 8th, he saw Lyle Herring wheeling a dolly trolley, which I think we call a sack truck here in the UK, one of these things on the screen right now. He was wheeling this trolley down the hallway in his apartment building at around midnight that night, so when most of his neighbours were asleep, apart from obviously Daniel who witnessed this, and Daniel said that on this trolley he saw what looked like a big rolled up carpet. Lyle wheeled it all the way to the end of the hall and he went with it inside the elevator. And at the time Daniel didn't really think anything of it, he probably just assumed that Leslie and Lyle didn't want the carpet anymore and so Lyle was taking it to the rubbish. However, after hearing about Leslie's disappearance and after the press conference Daniel thought about it a bit more and he realized that the carpet was very very thick so thick that it almost looked like it had been wrapped around something he even said that it was wide enough and round enough for a body a human body 
to be able to fit inside of it. So after he came to this realization, he immediately got in touch with the police and he told them about what he saw that night. And as soon as the police heard this, they were convinced that Leslie's body was inside of that carpet. Lyle had murdered his wife and used the carpet to help get her body out of the apartment building. They were sure of it. And then he probably put her body in his car and drove her somewhere to dispose of her. So with this theory in mind, the police seized Lyle Herring's cars. He had two cars, an SUV and a Cadillac. And they brought in a sniffer dog who was actually called Indiana Bones. And she was trained in sniffing out cadavers, human scent. So they brought in the dog Indiana Bones and they had her search Lyle's cars and in both vehicles the dog could smell human remains. Human remains had been in the trunks of both cars at one point. Obviously there were no human remains in there now. So this was another thing that supported the police's theory that Lyle had used his cars to transport Leslie's body somewhere. They think that after killing Leslie he rolled up her body in the carpet and he wheeled the carpet down to his SUV car. He put her in there for a short while then for some reason he moved her body to the trunk of his Cadillac car and then when he had decided where he was going to dispose of her body he put her back in the SUV. I'm not totally sure why he kept moving her body from one vehicle to the next. I think it may have been because his SUV was kept closer to his condo whereas as I understand it the Cadillac was parked in a more private garage a bit further away so he used the SUV to transport her to the Cadillac so that he could keep her in there in the more private secure garage until he worked out where he was going to dispose of his wife's body and then when he had decided he moved her back to the SUV and he drove to wherever he dumped her and that is what the police now had the task of figuring out where did Lyle Herring put Leslie's remains well in an attempt to find out the police decided to secretly put trackers on Lyle Herring's vehicles basically putting him under surveillance because even though by this point it had been months since Leslie went missing they thought that maybe he might return to the place where he dumped her body just to check that she still hadn't been found and just a couple of days after this operation began one morning the police followed Lyle as he drove to a quiet remote area in Griffith Park in LA which is just under three miles away from where he lived with Leslie from their condo he drove to Griffith Park and they watched as he pulled over he got out of his vehicle and he walked towards some dumpsters these big dumpsters I don't know if he looked inside of the dumpsters but he walked around them waited for a minute or so and then he got back in his car and he just drove away very strange so the police brought the cadaver dog Indiana Bones to this area to see if she could detect anything and sure enough she did she detected a spot on the ground very near these dumpsters where she could smell human remains. So the police immediately started digging in this spot thinking that this may have been Leslie Herring's burial site. However, they were wrong. There was nothing here, no human remains. But then why did Indiana Bones alert the police to the scent of human remains in this spot? Well, what detectives think may have happened was that Lyle Herring did in fact drive Leslie's body to this area. They think that he pulled her body out of the car whilst it was still wrapped up in the carpet. He put the car it on the ground in that spot near the dumpsters for just a moment and then he picked her up and threw her in one of the dumpsters and of course where did the dumpsters go? to the rubbish tip, to the LA dump, which is absolutely huge. Of course it is, it's LA. And I can only imagine that when the detectives came to this conclusion, their hearts must have just sunk. They realized that if that was the case, if Leslie's body really had been transported to the dump, there was now little to no chance of ever finding her. I don't know if they did try to search the dump for Leslie or if they concluded that it was just too risky and too dangerous and unsafe for police and search teams to do that. But yeah, unfortunately, Leslie's body was not found. She was not recovered. But the police had now reached a point in the investigation where they were confident that the evidence that they had obtained proved that Lyle Herring killed his own wife, 
despite the fact that they had no body. And so finally, more than a year after her disappearance, in April of 2010, Lyle Herring was arrested. He was arrested at his work and he was ultimately charged with murder. Lyle still denied it, he still maintained his innocence and so he pleaded not guilty and his case went to trial. And obviously during the trial, the prosecution put forward their version of events to the jury, which they based off of the evidence that had been collected by the police. So as we know, as we've discussed in this video, Lyle and Leslie's marriage by February of 2009 was just at breaking point. Leslie was stressed about their financial situation because Lyle wasn't working and she just did not want to be with him anymore. She wanted to separate. And so she wrote him that letter telling him that she was going to leave him, that she couldn't do it anymore, that he had broken her. And it's believed that Lyle found this letter, he read it and he was angry. He was furious that Leslie didn't want to be with him because he still wanted to be with her. And so what the police think happened is that to try and get back in Leslie's good books and make up with her, Lyle offered to wash Leslie's hair while she was in the bath. Apparently that was quite a regular thing that they did. If Lyle ever had something to apologise for, he would do so by washing Leslie's hair. So it's believed that he was doing that. She was in the bath, he was washing her hair when the two of them started talking about Leslie's letter. Lyle started trying to convince Leslie not to leave him but she didn't give in. She was adamant that she was going and that she wasn't coming back. This was the end of their relationship and in that moment Lyle Herring snapped. He lost it. He decided that she wasn't going anywhere and so he pushed Leslie's head under the water and held her there until she died, until she drowned. The reason that the police think that that's how the murder happened, the reason they think that he drowned her is because of the towels that were found in the bathrooms. Remember earlier I mentioned how there were a load of towels in the bathrooms that had been hung up to dry and they were so, so crinkled. It was clear that they had been used to soak up a hell of a lot of water. So that's why it's been theorised that Leslie was drowned in the bathtub. They think that during the struggle, while she was trying to come back up for air and he was holding her down. A load of the water from the bath splashed out onto the floor and so after Leslie was dead, Lyle used the towels to clean up the bathroom. Following this, it's believed that he wrapped up Leslie's body in that carpet, he put the carpet on the trolley and later that night or the early hours of the next morning around midnight, he wheeled her body to the trunk of his car and then he later drove her body to the dumpsters in Griffith Park he put her in one of them and then obviously from there she would have been taken to the LA dump site and then after he got rid of his wife's body as we know he tried to cover up the crime he tried to make it look as though Leslie was still alive he planted the Starbucks receipt in her purse he called her cell phone numerous times etc etc and then of course he himself disappeared for a while I mean he hung around for a few days after the murder as we know he made really weird comments to his cousin Malcolm about Leslie, how he was going to burn in hell for what he did to her. He avoided Leslie's sister, Asha, and then eventually he fled to Mexico before returning to the US a few weeks later when his vehicle was spotted at the border. I do wonder why he decided to return. Maybe at first he decided to flee and go on the run in Mexico, but then after thinking it over, he realised how that would look. So he came back and he made up a story that he'd gone to Mexico to look for his wife himself. He went to such lengths to try and cover up what he had done but thankfully the police were able to piece this case together and catch him out. So that was the prosecution's version of events. As for the defence team, they claimed that Lyle Herring was innocent because Leslie wasn't even dead. She was still alive and out there somewhere. They claimed that there was not sufficient evidence to prove that she was dead, so the jury should not believe that she was dead and that she had been murdered by Lyle. However, ultimately, 
ultimately the jury were not buying that and when the trial came to an end it was announced that the verdict was guilty. Lyle Herring was guilty of the second degree murder of his own wife Leslie and in June of 2013 he was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison which is where he still remains to this day. As far as I'm aware Lyle Herring has still never confessed, he's never admitted what he did to Leslie and so of course he's also never disclosed where her body is, what he did with her. Obviously as I said the police believe that she was transported to the LA dump but he's never confirmed that, he's refused to give Leslie's family those answers and as I mentioned earlier tragically Leslie's body was never found and has never been found to this day more than 13 years later which is just horrific and awful that her poor family were never able to properly say goodbye and give her a proper funeral. Hopefully one day soon her remains will be found so that she can be given a nice burial and laid to rest. But that is it for this case. That is the case of Leslie Herring. As always, please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case in the comments. I really want to hear what you guys think. Also feel free to let me know in the comments of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel. Please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next time for another mystery with Molly.